of the cost control Are webinar. Labor, labor Sorry, say it again. Oh, okay. I think you were talking to me. Okay, so the first session we covered these concepts: um, direct cost versus indirect costs and overhead, uh, direct cost types versus direct cost groups, direct job cost versus direct non-job type GL accounts, over under allocated indirect cost loaded labor factor, and then um, so we'll see what we get done today. These were the concepts we covered in the first session, um, the agenda points. So let's talk about the, kind of the concepts in the second session. And uh, so what job cost reports do we use to tie total job cost to the income statement? And, it, and that's basically a system standard report that will recap your job costs by job, by cost type actually by cost group, and uh, it'll tie into your income statement. So job cost, job cost reports, the number one print billing, direct costs and burdens, and then summary. So we go job cost, job cost reports, print billing, direct costs and burdens, and then summary, and we pick our date range. And so we get basically your projects, your, your labor hours, your gross labor, material, sub, equipment, other, then your total direct costs, and then your labor burden, percent burden, total cost and total billing. And then here's your income statement, your job revenue will show in the billing column. This is not necessarily, um, so the non-job revenue would be over under billing. We took that out so you could just tie this right into your billing column. So then you have, because you're over under billings, you're usually posted after you make sure everything ties out. And then so you tie your billing out there. And then total costs tie in here. So labor, material, sub, equipment, other labors, and for example, the gross labor column. And then our labor burden. Remember the direct non-job expense concept. That's where our burdens post in. And then our percent burden. So this is our general ledger versus job cost billing differences across the bottom. Okay. So what job cost report has an on-demand drill down on labor burden for each time card row? So one support call we get a lot is um, they'll look. People will look at this report and they'll say, "Okay, what is that burden? What does it consist of?" So the answer to that question is actually this report. So it's the same report, okay? So we'll, but we have to drill down a couple levels to see it. So we'll drill down in this labor for the Glenwood Springs job. So there's the Glenwood Springs job, general requirements. Double click on that. And there's two time card line items in there. And it's got the blue number, I don't know if you can see that, hopefully you can, it's a dark blue, the 4290. And we click on that 4290 and it gives us an on-demand sub-report. Remember from last session, we talked about on-demand sub-reports being a completely different report just supporting that number. So there's the 4290 and it can be broken down between general liability, workman's comp, FICA, Medicare, so state unemployment, SDI, FUTA, and additional concepts like uh, 401k and things like that will show up union. So there's the 4290. So that's how you get to how you answer that question. So if we said, okay, I had a labor, gross labor of 8603, labor burden of 1944, and percent burden. The percent burden is that percent that you set here. Generally, this is the simplified way of doing it. Whoops, under burden, utilities preferences burden, the 30%. And then you can do, you can do additional concepts with that with your burden utility grid, which we showed last week. And <clears throat> so that's that number of the 1944. We'll just keep drilling down until we see the labor, and then that's the 2694 that we just drilled down on. Okay. The next concept is what's the purpose of the direct non-job expense GL accounts? Okay, so this is more of an architectural concept with the system, and the purpose is to post by paycheck 
the total of each type of burden for a direct for the uh, direct GL direct labor GL account. Therefore, not requiring postings to each payroll burden type by time card. So, let's cover that concept that we just looked at over here. So we have 2690. So what we've done here is we've in the database itself we have our debits and credits, right? That our general ledger looks at, and this is the debit, the gross wage. Now, there for a paycheck, a given paycheck, you'll have several line items that hit your general ledger. You'll have a cost for workman's comp, FICA, Medicare, state unemployment, federal unemployment. Okay, and that equals 2694. In this case, so you have one, two, three, four, five different types of burdens hitting this particular paycheck line item, this particular line item. So if you look in the general ledger for Gilbert Mestis on 1-3-2013, actually this is going to be his work date. In the general ledger, we'd have to figure out what check date that 6006 showed up on. However, job cost reports are done based on the work date, not the check date. It's the general ledger based on the check date, though, and that's why we accrue wages. But we had the six line, the six burden types, right? One, two, three, four, five. Well, five burden types, and then we had the one line item. So theoretically, you could have six line items going to your job cost. So if we go into this job, or if we look, if we go to the job cost report here we see there's only one. And these items are rolled up and, and totaled for this item. Now if we go over to the general ledger, what happens in the system from an architectural standpoint, the way we architected it, the way we designed it, is the direct labor account will get hit with the gross wage. Now there are additional columns on every row that go into the general ledger. One of them is called labor burden. So for your direct costs type accounts, we'll correlate that to our income statement. So for every, so here we have our income statement and we've got different types of income statement accounts. Whoops. Sorry about that. Okay, so I didn't mean to do it that way. The concepts are simple, but they're a little hard to, to uh, convey, so we'll just take a little time here. Okay, so you've got your um, your direct cost accounts, all right, and we have our general ledger, and you'll look at these general ledger accounts, and it says a direct job expense account. But you look down here, it says direct non-job expense, non-job expense, so on and so forth. If we drill down into the labor account, you'll notice the labor accounts in the general ledger have more sophistication. There's this extra expenses expense association or adjustment association area. So for 401k, that's going to go to the 59 series account. For federal unemployment, it's going to go to the 5920 account. And so the 5920 account is right there, payroll taxes. So the burdens will post into these non direct non-job, which means that's our way of saying they're going to go with, we consider these direct cost accounts, but they're they don't get a job number. So let's say this this guy had 10 line items on his time card. All 10 of the line items would show up in your direct cost account, the direct labor account, but only one row would show up in uh, for each of those costs in the direct non-job section. So when I look at the, the 
the key is is that when I look at my job cost report, I don't see you know six items this one time card row. If I saw six items for one time card row, the detail becomes useless because there's too it's too much. It's not straightforward and simplified. So we take just the portion that was applied to this time card that ends up being in the general ledger, and we accumulate those five different burdens and put them in a separate column in the database. So if you were to look at the database, you'd see this number, this number, and this number for that one row in the database. So it's separated, and at 34, 32, or the 29, 26 consists of several, like six rows in these various accounts here between these accounts. And how do we know where, what, where they go? We know where they go. The system knows where to put them based on this expense association thing that we did here. So we've eliminated a lot of detail into the into the system, even though the system is you know has all the detail it needs. So your job cost reports are simplified. You don't have six items; you have one item. I'll just mute my phone. Okay. So let's go back to the question and see if we can. So it's to post the paychecks in total to each of the burden by type. So in total, we posted the FUTA to the to the payroll tax expense account, the 590. So for the 10 line items in our example that went to Gilbert Mestis for this paycheck, you only got one row that one item that posted into this account. So if we look at the payroll journal for 6006, there's that paycheck. And this is the detail. We had one, two, three, four, five. He actually had five time card rows. They hit the GL and they hit this account, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. And then he's got some liabilities that are going into the, the liability section. But you'll see there's only one for FUTA here for the total FUTA. And that 480 actually went across each of those rows. And you'll notice that in our other report for the 2694, the FUTA was only 96 cents, but across the 96, probably because they're all even rows, 96 times 5 is probably 100%. something similar to that. So anyway, there's probably, I'm not sure exactly what, where that's at, but there's, so there's the total of the, of the five rows, and then same thing with Medicare, that's the total of the five rows. So you can see that the detail that went into the, the transaction is a little more condensed than you, you don't have six rows times five. You don't have 30 rows for this time card. You really just have five rows. So that's why it's done the way it is. And it, it's a very successful scheme. It keeps things simple. And, and our job cost does tie out very tightly. So the next concept, what happens if we post what happens if we post a transaction to a direct non-job expense GL account? Well, the system is set up to take those direct non-job expense accounts and um, <clears throat> and just be the total of the amount that's showing up in the payroll burden, right? So that we tie out to job cost. If you post something else in there, it's not designed for you to accept things in there. And uh, so then what happens is you don't tie, your job cost doesn't tie out. So if your job cost doesn't tie out, one of the reports we send you to is this print direct non-job cost exceptions. So, so if we print that, it'll show us there were no exceptions. By the way, that report should print at the bottom of this. It's tied in as an on-demand sub-report. So if, it did, if you had something that didn't tie out, you'd get this extra little section down here, and there would, would be some blue lettering. You'd click on it and bring up that report. Okay. 
<clears throat> How do you find a direct non-job exception? That's, that's what we just talked about. And then what report cleanly exports to Excel for the CPA to, uh, with respect to the summary of contracts? And so, you know, the CPAs will generate the, the job schedule in the back of their financial statements. And here's a place, this summary contracts worksheet, this is designed for you to be able to export it. And so you just say, summary contracts worksheet, put your year end date in there. We'll just do, the demo date is in uh, January of 2013, so we'll do that. Usually it'd be December 31st, 2012. Hit preview. And uh, this envelope icon is, the, and it gives you the ability to export or email uh, various formats, we'll say Excel, and you can go to application, which it'll bring, if you do that, it'll bring up Excel right into your window. I'm on a Mac, so I have to do it to disk file, because it'll bring up the, what'll happen is it'll bring it up in, in Excel on the Mac side, so. If you have a PC-based computer, you don't have to take this extra step, and we'll just put it on our desktop, and it's called SumCon Worksheet. We'll say save it. And then we'll go over here to the desktop. Some kind of worksheet. And then it's going to open in Microsoft Excel on our side. That error message you get is always just, just has struggles with the name that Crystal tries to get it, but these are the this is the worksheet. So now they have their subsequent billing and their current cost. And they don't have to type up your jobs, and it gives them additional columns for analytical review that they they're supposed to go through, like the current year labor burden, current year system burden, subsequent costs. They're supposed to analyze that and uh, prior year cost columns. So then they can take this and move it into their Excel spreadsheets and manipulate the data without having to without charging you to type things up from scratch. A lot of CPAs will actually just use our summary of contracts in their financial statements, but I would say the majority do not. Okay, so what report helps verify that the carryover jobs are properly accounted for when you are having trouble tying your job cost to your income statement? So uh, the reason it's so important to tie your job cost into your income statement is because your job cost basically supports your estimating process. By tying it into your income statement, you prove that job cost. Okay, your income statement is a component of your finance, of your general ledger. Um, basically, your double entry system of accounting. And if you go through and you tie out your books, thereby making sure everything's accurate. And if you if you do the uh, month end webinar thing, we talk about test of balances and and the concepts and the checklist that we present. Um, so your books are not accurate unless you do some sort of work on them, a test of balances concept that you deal with your balance sheet, right? So by tying it into an income statement, and uh, income statement that includes a test of balance work papers that verify that your financial statements are in good shape, you basically prove your job cost numbers. Your job cost numbers support your estimates with your budget actual variance concepts. And by supporting your estimates, um, you can ask questions like, how do I know if this is accurate? And answer those questions. So for example, if we go over here to um, one of the reports, And we'll just talk about labor, for example. Here's a labor performance extended. It has all the other line items in it, like material sub, other types, but this one gives you the information on labor that you would you could you could pose questions on. For example, um, here we have this is demo data, so it doesn't necessarily make sense. But here we have a job. We have a budget, sixteen thousand budget hours, and then hourly rate burdened hourly rate or loaded labor hourly rate. 
loaded hourly rate. And then you have actual costs, you have your actual hours, and then you have your actual loaded hourly rate, and that includes your burdens, okay? Your FICA few to suited work comp, general liability, and it also includes your percent burden. And the percent burden is set up to pick up your indirect cost pool. This is how things are generally set up. Doesn't mean everybody does it this way, and you may not do it exactly this way. Uh, you might burden through the burden utility grid and do do things differently. But anyway, so here we have an actual hourly rate. So the question is, how do I know that's right? And the answer is, you know what's right if your over under allocation is close to zero. Okay. So and how do you know that what job cost has hit your job? It's the total direct cost, which includes your indirect cost allocations, your burdens, your FICA fee to suit work comp general liability insurance, and your percent burden allocated to your jobs. So this this is the number that ties into your summary of contracts or to or to this job cost report, right? The 107331. So as long as you're tying there, 107331, then you're then you know you've tied your job cost out to your general ledger. Let's see if we have this summary of contracts where we can pull it up. Well, we must have got out of it. Anyway, so if you, um, let me pull it up just so we correlate it. So there's our small job schedule, completed jobs and open jobs, and the 107.331. So this is a full summary of contracts, or what we label as a full summary of contracts. And it's a full summary of contracts because we show the completed project as well as the open jobs. You subtract out the amounts that carried in from the previous fiscal year, and you get the current fiscal year number. So job to date, today, job to date, the 113.91, through the end of the previous fiscal year end. In this case, it was 12.31.2012 gives us our number on our income statement, and that's crucial. Okay, this, this double entry set of books has a bank reconciliation that ties into your bank accounts. It has agings that tie into your general ledger, AR, AP, agings that tie out your AP. So you've got a tight set of books if you're doing a monthly test of balances, a set of work papers, and this number is tying in here. So you're tied your job cost into your general ledger, you know what your total job cost is, and you know what the difference is, and that gives you a feel for how accurate this number is, this 3786. And if you do that retroactive allocation we did in our uh, burden utility grid, then this number it becomes perfect, and you'll so you know whether the number in your estimating process is reasonable or not. So in your labor, you've got a variance overall, right? We have actual. Let's say this line item was done in actual costs, we have budgeted cost, and we have a variance. So budget actual variance. And of that variance on labor, you've got two components. You've got a variance due to hours, which is your production variance, and you've got a variance due to your rate. Okay, and if we take the $2.14, which is the $40 plus the 38, and multiply it by the number of hours we actually had on the project, the 18, that gives you your rate variance. So you could say, you know, one another question might be, I, on my variance, how much of it was due to my field guys beating their budget on hours? And that number is 15288 And how much of it is due to my estimate, my rate and my estimate being different than the actual rate that came through my accounting system? And that number is $38.47. On the other types of costs, you don't have that rate variance for the most part. Okay, so what's the purpose of accruing wages? The purpose is to get your labor worked in the, uh, so basically we're talking about, so we work, do labor in January that gets paid in February. You know, all your job cost reports are based on the work date, your general ledger is based on the check date. So therefore the job cost has costs in January, the general ledger doesn't have the cost until February, so you accrue wages to get the costs in January on your general ledger that matches your cost on your job cost that's in January automatically. So this labor has to match what's in the job cost. The job cost is based on the work date. The labor gets hit based on the check date. So when we accrue wages, it's going to increase this account to make it match what's hit the job cost. Increases your labor to make it match what's hit the job cost. 
So to get to get the labor worked in the first month, which we're saying is January, that is paid in the second month, February, on the general ledger. Okay, paychecks always post in the month of the checks. So like some of our competitors, most of our competitors in our price point, I think all of them actually, post don't post don't accrue wages. They will actually uh, try to tie the bonding. They call it a bonding report. We're the only ones that we're aware of that does a full summary of contracts. And unless you do the full summary of contracts, you're not really able to answer those questions, right? So they end up having to manually do it if they do it at all. So then, um, basically, they'll try to match the, the. They'll just do a bonding report, which will be an uncompleted job section, and they'll match the cost will match the number in the general ledger because the cost on their bonding reports based on check date, not on work date. So if you're labor intensive, then you know it's kind of important to make sure that your job cost is based on work date. If you're a general contractor and have very little labor in the field, then maybe that's immaterial. But it's still done right through the system. So what is the importance uh, what is, why is it important to go over the summary contracts when we're uh, presenting cost control? And the significance of the summary contracts is that we tie the job cost to the general ledger. Okay, and to support the concept, knowing that your job costs are ac of knowing that your job costs are accurate, to support that concept with respect to having everything in them that is in your accounting records. So there's a concept of managing your company through your financial statements. Okay, so when you um, so if you manage your company through your financial statements, what that means is you always know your bottom line essentially, and you determine. There's a concept. There was a company out of Colorado that did a great job of consulting for a lot of years, and I think they still do. It's called Fails Management, and, and their concept was in their name, in that you identify your failure criteria. So if your failure criteria, you know, let's say you you want to make ten thousand dollars a month, and if you don't make ten thousand in your net income bottom line, then you've identified your failure criteria. And so if you make over ten thousand, then you consider it successful. If you make under ten thousand, then you consider it unsuccessful. Well, if you know what your bottom line is, then you're, you know, you can determine that, and you can manage your company through your financial statements, paying profit sharing out of an unprofitable company doesn't make any sense, yet companies do that all the time. So if you take your bottom line and you say, if there's no bottom line, there's no bonuses, well, we pay 10% of our bottom line out to bonuses. We pay 5% of our bottom line out to bonuses based on profitability of projects. I've seen that. It doesn't equate to a heck of a lot of money sometimes, but it's very effective. I mean, whether you pay a little or you pay a lot, it has the same effect. In fact, paying a, little, a lower number, in my opinion, sometimes makes more sense because when people get, you know, they should they should be generating profits based on what they earn. And, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a client practicing in Public County pay off 50% of his profits to his employees, 50% of the net income. And the point he made is that they just can't, it's not that they appreciate it, it came that they, they just came to expect it. And so while he did a much more than other owners were doing, they were, it was just, you know, it was a hassle for them. So. Anyway, maybe that's, that, that high percentage works for some and doesn't work for others. But anyway, so to pay profit sharing based on bottom line makes sense. And uh, to make it mechanical and to make sure you tie your indirect costs in some way into your equation. If you base it, let's say you're going to pay it to your project managers, 5% of your bottom line to your profit to project managers based on profitability of projects. If you, if you lost money on one job, be tied in, it'd be grouped with money he made on other jobs and and so the overall profitability for the year, that that seems to be a good way to do it. Anyway, so that's that's the concept that you are able to identify what you're doing. There's a non, non another concept of viability. Um, I was in Starbucks one time and they had a plaque on the wall and um, it talked about profitability and viability of a company. And the difference the difference between being viable and not being viable is very little. If you make a dollar every day, in 10 years you'll be here. If you lose a dollar every day, you know, maybe it'll eventually you won't be here anymore. So 
being able to be profitable and knowing it what your bottom line is every month that's that's a great concept and uh, so the test of balances is something we you know promoted with the CPA firm the reason we developed the system was so that we w it would become easier for our customers to to support their estimating process and know that they tied in and to do the test of balances every month and through the reason we did so well as a CPA firm is that we've really push our clients to do that test of balances and to tie out their full summary contracts every month and the bonding companies love this and so they refer us. So, and I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore because that was a terrible life, lifestyle. It's hard, too much work during tax season. Okay, so how do you verify that your accounting records are accurate? Uh, you perform test of balances on your balance sheet accounts and selected income statement accounts. And then, uh, Okay, I think that's something happened to that. So, so what are the three cost control mechanisms that we're, that we're promoting in this webinar? And it's subcontracts, purchase orders, and job status hours. We're starting to get into the next session, but what I want to do is kind of lay the groundwork for that. In this session, we talk about the tie-out process, how important it is to tie the job cost into the general ledger and the significance of doing that is that you support your estimating process with some some reason with a reasonable assurance of accuracy okay so the concept on cost control is that what are the components of that and so um, in tying the concepts all together we move through our projects with some sort of control mechanisms on our cost okay and we go to this report here, billing commitment analysis for this golden job. We'll see that we've done purchase orders and subcontracts. This is this report's based on that. And we have, for example, we've got uh, this all city tile has a seven thousand dollar subcontract, and here all city rentals has two thousand dollars in invoices with no no commitment against it. If we look at All City Tile and we click on it, it shows us that we have three invoices posted to that subcontract agreement. It shows us how much money is coming in that's on the balance of that cost line item or on the cost we, we signed up for. So our cost control, this, this report shows our, our committed cost by vendor okay, or subcontractor. And so this is the subs and vendors are here. Um, if we go, you know, there are different places we can pull up the, we can pull up these job status reports. Let's pull it up here. So by phase cost code, here's, here's our original budget, change orders, revised budget, our revised total commitments, okay? And if I come down here to this change order, um, see which one it is. So it's this one here, there's this uh, $22,000 revised total, total commitment, I click on it, gives me basically the same report. There's two subs on this change order, 7,000, and then we have our invoice amount, and we have our accounts payable amount, okay? And if we had any checks, like we have checks here, and it identifies what's in it, how come there's accounts payable, and this is the balance of the commitment. So, so our overall balance on that commitment, there's our sub-report in that tab, our balance on the commitment, so there's their costs on the commitment. This report doesn't show the balance, but job to date cost. Okay, so it shows us, you know, the job status reports show us kind of where we're at. Now the estimated cost to complete is a component beyond the revised budget. And we see a lot of our customers actually change the revised budget to do their summary contracts. And in my opinion, that's probably not what you want to do. 
you want to preserve your revised budget so you can do your budget actual variances. Even if you just do a, like a summary contracts line item adjustment on your estimates, I think you should just use the job status because it's designed for that. So if we come into this golden job and we go to our status tab and we click this status icon, it gives us the ability to manipulate where we're going to come in on each of the line items. Okay, so here we, this is a general contractor's face cost code list, but you know whether it's a GC or a sub, it doesn't matter. Um, so we have our original budget, our change orders, our adjusted budget, commitments, our balance and our commitments, then our actual costs, and then we have our two complete costs. And so then what you can do is you can change this. Um, so let's say we determine that we're going to spend an extra $2,000 on this line item. There's no cost today, so it would be 32000 Or we're, you can change your total estimated cost, or you can change your percent complete. So let's say we think it's going to cost $17,000 in labor on this now. And, um, or we can put, or to complete it, we can put 20000 total, or we can put you know 5% to complete. Now, on your labor line items, you can, let's tie those in. We'll sort by type. Now we have labor, and it looks like we're good on our sorting here. So I hit save. Yeah, Eric. Eric. Yeah. On that labor, yes. um, how do you like? Because obviously you can have labor shown as a dollar amount, but also maybe hours associated with it because you want to track the hours. Where do you punch the mm -hmm. hours in here? Um, the way we're doing it right now, we have a revision to this grid. It gives us additional columns for hours, so you can punch the hours in and it'll change your percent complete. But the way we're doing it right now is we're taking this, and we showed this, I think I showed this to you guys last time. We take this um, percent complete column uh, over here, mm -hmm. this projected column, and it brings up a job status hours report. And they'll put in the percent complete they are. And then based on that percentage completion, it'll reproject their hours. Or if they if they just put in their total hours, we can do the math to back into the percent, put the percent in here. So if we say, you know, they say 25, 20, let's say 25, 55, 25, hit save, and hit the lightning bolt on the report. Mm -hmm. And it comes up with the projected hours, but you can the total estimated hours. But if they cross through that and they put in their total estimated hours, you just do the math to get your percentage and bolt the percentage in. Okay, so you punch in the uh, you just punch in the percent complete, and then it'll it's just going to self calculate the revised hours. Right, or if you want them to cross through the total hours and put hours in, then you just back into the math on that and put it in, maybe in Excel mm -hmm. or something. You could download download this to Excel and do a formula column. OK. Right. So until you get that enhancement on our side, that's how you would do okay. it. OK, you just can't do it in the system, per se. Um, in the, you know, like, like you just were typing in $5,000 and 100, you know, you know an extra be better hours could, of labor. Right, the better if you could just type it into a column here, right? I agree. Yeah, that's what I was kind of looking at. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're sorry, I'm sorry. Bye, bye. Digress. Okay, so that's those are the concepts there. So you you adjust your hours, and then uh, the projection for the summary of contracts now is based on that. So if we come over here to our job status grid. We have a total estimated cost of 254 because we've changed these numbers, right? So our variance is 28 now. If we change this to 45, just so you can see the numbers change, now we're at 256. So we save that. You project your line items and you buy your line items out. So the more you can buy your line items out, the safer the job becomes for you. Like if you have material, you have POs on all your material purchases. Your accounting is done because you've generated your POs, and your accounting is done by creating your your AP invoices from your purchase orders. Like a, a subcontractor 
that can uh, basically buy out his labor. In the housing industry, they do that some, and it, they become their jobs become a lot safer for them. They make a fixed amount of money on their labor. So the argument the argument sometimes is maybe you can make more on your labor by just managing it. But when you tie in their compensation to what you've got in the budget, then you've basically taken the risk of out of there. Um, so once you do that, then your projection, let's go to the summary contracts if we can find it. Here's the summary contracts. And when you run, generate the summary contracts, you need to make sure you say, uh, the status hours, so you say 131 is our cutoff date, and the budget method is, is status hours, okay? Now, that's the same thing as doing it here, through over under billings and clicking status there, okay? This is the dialogue before, this is the dialogue if you do it after you have it up on your screen. Okay, so then our, our 256.309 is the number that we generated with our job status grid, 256.309. Our over under billings is driven by information coming from the field, from our project managers, and our overall profitability on our projects is generated that way. So then when we accrue our over under billings, now we've tied with people, uh, the people familiar with the projects and are in the field into your bottom line on your income statement. And you also use it as an accountability concept. So if I click calculate, you'll see my under billings are here, 133.98 here, post it. And my revenue is going to be 108 here. So the mechanics are all done for you. The 108 will tie right in here. And I know a lot of you guys are doing this, but the significance is now you've taken the job status grid and, and the project managers and brought them into your accounting process. And you've gotten a bottom line that basically gives them, is coming from then giving you information on the projects and the, and the profitability of the projects as, as you move through the projects. So if your quick turn projects is not as significant, but still some sort of evaluation on how they do on their projects is important. If it's a big project, project it's important because if they're monitoring those projects and paying attention to it, then you've got, you've got what you want from them rather than you having to make sure they're doing everything right. You're looking at a number that they're projecting on a regular basis. And if you have a huge fade at the end of the job, then you know, then you're asking questions of what happened. And and then, you know, that's a that's a negative item and you you basically have your failure criteria there that you're specifying. You know, we want the project to come in as you project it and how the accuracy of your projections on the projects are important. So cost control is a big deal, obviously. And after the fact is not as good as while it's happening. Okay. So let's kind of, we have a, about another 10 minutes. Um, let's kind of review where we're at. So we have cost types and we have cost groups. Okay. And we'll correlate it here. Cost, cost types are here have as many of those as you want. Cost groups are here and you only have five. And the reason we have five is because we have the standard reporting concepts of labor material sub equipment other, labor material sub equipment other, industry standard reporting concepts. And that's how we determine what falls into each column. So there are three types of costs in a project-oriented entity. There are direct costs, indirect costs, and operating expenses. Okay, we have a couple of things we could look at here. Here we have an income statement, and um, we have our direct costs, our indirect costs, and our operating expenses. Okay, this is our income statement. Over here we have a bid, direct costs, indirect costs. The indirect costs are tied in labor here. Okay because we'll bid them as indirect as labor, generally. And then we have our total projected cost, and this, the number, the total projected cost would be the same thing as cost of revenue. The profit and overhead would be the same thing as gross profit. So we always job cost to our gross profit number. Our overhead is below our gross profit. So when we 
do a bid, we say profit and overhead. And that includes our gross profit and our overhead. So let's say this company had, you know, as a percentage, a couple thousand, let's say this is the only job and they had a couple thousand of operating expenses. So their income from operations would be that. Okay. So this would be the net income. So your net income, your profit and your estimate is the same as the income from operations. Okay, there's another item here that we can go through on identifying our cost types. We have direct cost, indirect cost, and GNA. So what is, how do we define those? So depreciation on a copier that's in the office, that's going to be sales GNA. Depreciation on a copier for plans, uh, bids, and actual job costs. The bidding process is part of sales GNA or operating expenses. So the bidding process part would be GNA. And the actual job cost part would be, for jobs you already have, should be indirect. So the selling process and the estimating process are considered, not considered job costs. It's, they're considered below the line, below the gross profit line. Depreciation on a project manager's vehicle. Well, it could be indirect and it could be GNA, right? Well, actually, project manager is just on the projects that you already have, so it's just indirect. Depreciation on an estimator's vehicle would be GNA because he's in the estimating before you get the job process. Depreciation on field equipment would be indirect. You know, when you record the monthly depreciation, just because an asset was on a job site all month long doesn't mean you should take it and apply it to that, that job. It could have been on five jobs, so it starts to become impractical. So that as a general rule, that depreciation gets pooled into the equipment and then the equipment gets applied to the projects about in a reasonable manner. If you have heavy equipment, you're going to do it based on equipment, the fixed asset concepts in the system. If you have, if you don't have heavy equipment and it's you know skidsters and smaller equipment, um, you're going to do it based on probably based on labor. Travel to look at a job in the bid uh, to be bid since it's a pre-job. And you don't have the job yet. It sells GNA or operating expenses. Health insurance on field employees, office, and mechanic. Well, the field employees, the health insurance. If we we really want that to be direct, sometimes it's a flat amount per month. On your Davis Bacon jobs, you can get a certain amount of that applied to your cash fringe, uh, and you can set it up in the system for whatever they'll give you as a direct cost. Um, but it, a lot of times it's it's indirect because it's impractical to apply to a specific job. And then, so that's the field employees. The office is going to be sales GNA, and the mechanic is going to be indirect cost. The mechanic that works on your equipment. Shop rent. A shop is considered indirect cost, so it's indirect. Fuel on a on field vehicles. This is general. These are generally accepted accounting principles. By the way, uh, fuel on field vehicles that would be an indirect cost because it's not practical to apply it directly to a job, even though some people do do that. And, you know, as long as it's reasonable, that's all that matters. So it's appropriate for them to apply it to the job, directly to the jobs if, if that's a reasonable way to do it. So office uh, manager health insurance would be in the office, so it sells GNA. Uh, Non-productive field labor. Now the field guys come in the shop and they're doing something in the shop, and that's indirect cost. So a big cost concept is indirect costs. I had a client one time that he made, one year he made 100000 the next year he made, he lost 200000 And um, actually it was, it was, it was a 6000 it was a $600,000 difference. So the first, first year he made 200000 the second year he lost 600000 or $400,000. So it was a $600,000 swing. He did the same revenue roughly, he had the same cost structure roughly. And um, he's like, how come the years were different? I don't get it. And his indirect costs went, his indirect costs grew from 300000 in indirect to 900000 in indirect. And he lost complete control of his indirect cost. And uh, non-productive field labor is, you know, added right into the indirect cost. He had <clears throat> did a lot more maintenance of his equipment, that kind of stuff. And it really added up. And so it was a big difference.
So repair to a skid screw would be indirect. So controlling your costs on your income statement would mean really trying to reduce your indirect cost. You know, uh, hiring a mechanic in a shop is a lot more expensive than just this mechanic's wage. That person spends money every day, all day. Having it outsourced sometimes is a lot less expensive overall. So you have to take that. So anyway, interest on an excavator loan. Indira interest on a field piece of equipment is actually considered indirect cost. Interest on operating an operating line of credit is considered other income and expense. Okay. So uh, take a di when you take a discount on job materials, if you planned on it in the estimating process, I would say it's direct cost, reduction in direct cost. And then if you didn't, then it's other income and expense. It's a cash flow item. Hotel expense for an out-of-town job, that would be direct costs. So you have these indirect versus direct cost concepts versus G&A, but you also have a concept called fixed versus variable. We talked about, just cover that one more time. Uh, your, direct, your field costs, the direct costs in the field are variable. If you don't do the job, you're not going to incur any of it. Indirect can be split. You can have equipment that gets depreciated if you use it heavily or not heavily, so it's fixed. And the depreciation is, you know, maybe that's not fair, but it's done generally in, in accounting based on a straight line number of years rather than the hours operated. Even though you could say, I want to depreciate my equipment based on the hours operated, I have an, uh, you know, an operation, a life on that piece of equipment of 20,000 hours or 10,000 hours, and, and I want to depreciate it, based on, depreciate it based on the hours that the operator has on it. And our system actually keeps track of that, and it increments it as you work on it, too. So, so the meter reading will increment as you turn in hours from the operator, or you generate fixed asset depreciations. Yeah. And that information is in the general ledger as well. So we can report on it. Okay, so then your home office overhead is going to be a fixed cost. So fixed cost versus variable cost. There's the concept there. Um, okay, so those are it's kind of what we wanted to talk about today as far as our session two. Our session three will focus more on the cost control mechanisms and then uh, We'll pull everything together with our session four concepts. Anyway, anybody have any questions? No. Nope. Okay. Well, I appreciate you guys sitting in on this, and um, we'll hopefully see you next week. <laughs>